Hello, welcome to the Women's Show. It's me, Chris Brack. Uh, we are sponsored by bookmakers.com and I'm joined by Philippa, Neil and Emma. How are we all doing? Yeah, good, okay. thanks. Good, good. Nice quiet weekend in the women's football. Nothing exciting happened really, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Standard. Nothing to Standard. talk about. <laughs> yeah, so we will talk about the Live Women's Day, but I'll be honest, we've got to talk about the elephant in the room, which was, for those, for just peep behind the curtain, this is Monday this is Monday, so this is the day after uh, the women's football weekend of what games there were. So just to set the scene, uh, Liverpool were away at Chelsea. Big game, you know, Liverpool had already beaten Chelsea um, and pretty cold day. So we got an announcement at half past nine, there will be a pitch inspection. So we all sort of waited for, waited a bit of breath for that. Got told the match was going ahead, all grand. Uh, Liverpool fans travel on the coach for five hours from five o'clock in the morning, get there for the game to see... Six minutes of uh, dancing on ice, pretty much. No real football, uh, and Stengel got a shot off. To which then the referee went, that's it, game's over. Thanks very much for coming. Um, all live on BBC Two. Six minutes of football, thanks very much. And that's the, that was the start of the weekend, which is not the best start. Uh, and then the Super League sent a, an official notification out saying, we worked hard with the club and the match officials to safely play the Barclays Women's Super League fixture between Chelsea and Liverpool as scheduled. Following inspections before the match, the pitch was deemed playable by the match day official. We'll come back to that. However, shortly after kickoff, the referee made the decision to abandon the match in order to protect the safety of players, which is paramount. We sincerely apologise to all the fans who travelled to the match. Uh, the fixture will be rescheduled in due course, which is all. We'll start with you, Neil. Um, it comes across as really poorly organised, lack of leadership from the top, and very conflicting messages. Because we're sort of—I've also been under the impression that the referee wasn't keen to pass the pitch and was instructed it probably should go ahead. And for the women's game in general, live at BBC Two, seeing a six-minute game of football to then go, oh, actually, it's the pitch is too icy. It also, isn't a great look either. So I understand the desire to want the game to go ahead because you've got a. To a prime game in a good slot. It's a good day for it. Um, and as you say, it's on BBC Two. So all that's great and it's understandable. What makes a mockery of everyone is to play nine minutes of it and have all the videos afterwards of people sliding around and have the, the clear story told that I think we all understand like there is a chance it's unlikely given the reality of under soil heating and we can circle back onto that. But it's still possible that if, for instance, temperatures in this country for a serious period of time hit minus 10, then it would you know, put a lot of all football, uh, you know, men's and women's game at all levels massively at risk. My point here is that I think we all, as a football support and culture, understand the notion of the frozen pitch and that a game can't go ahead sometimes due to due to weather. What in this instance has happened from what looks like trying to force the game to go ahead, presumably for something to do with the broadcast reasons, um, although it is sort of worth saying that it could be a backlog of fixtures sort of question as well, but by presumably trying to force the game to go ahead, when it looks like the officials weren't in favour of it, it's crystal clear, both managers, because of what they say in the, the 10 minutes after the game's been cancelled, were strongly against it, and against all the common sense reactions of the women who have to play on the pitch themselves. It just makes... It makes a mockery of of everyone, really, and and the problem with that is that the people it doesn't make a mockery of are the the actual participants are the ones who want to lead it um, themselves because they're the ones it was say who, who were obviously of the view do not do this, don't go ahead with this game at half past nine, and people can see weather forecasts. the The idea of you know let's hang on in there and see how it is to me is just is just ludicrous, and then you're in a situation where you're then. You know, Emma Hayes is having to speak to the paying customers, which I'm sure she did so admirably, but it's still not the same. It is also worth pointing out, whilst it's a massive trek for many of the Liverpool supporters, getting in and around London on a day where it's minus three and minus four is no battle of laughs, to be fair to the Chelsea supporters themselves. You know, mm -hmm. the option that they... I understand to an extent at half past nine, there's a bit of an argument that the Liverpool coaches are already well on their way. But literally, you know, everyone else could have just been spared time, effort, hassle, uh, cost all the obvious bits and pieces within there and instead they they're put through it too and it just makes every it makes the whole thing just look a little bit daft and it makes the whole thing look a little bit daft live on bbc too and i think that that's one of your one of your key things here is that someone somewhere has decided to take some sort of gamble where 
everyone understands. I'll say it again. Everyone understands game calls off due to due, due to weather circumstances. Now we can talk about whether or not that should be happening, and we can talk about whether or not every single woman's pitch should have under soil heating, and we can talk about the general facilities around football in this country in a number of different ways. And it's absolutely fine to do that. But we literally, as a football support and culture, understand every now and again we get again a game gets called off because of bad weather. So it seems really strange to me to put everyone into a one in ten off chance that the pitch becomes in some way playable because the weather forecast is out by three or four degrees realistically at that time for it to all come together. And so I think that that's the whole thing just seems to, um, you know, when you talk about the lack of leadership, I think one of the key things here is that the WSL is able to have unsigned statements. The FA are able to not, you know, and, and, the, and the problem with this is that if you say stuff like that, it's like you, I want to see someone back or anything like that. I really don't. I just think that you end up in a situation where Emma Hayes has got your leadership from that year. Uh, the referee's got to, you know, show a degree of leadership within there as well. And maybe, you know, he could have been stronger possibly, but then we don't know because we don't know what the exchange is and who he's had the exchange with. So he's left looking like a bit of a divvy. who looks like he's got no no ability to referee or call a football match if the general feeling is he thought it shouldn't go ahead. The whole thing's just, it's just one of those things where no one ends up with their name attached to any form of a decision. And therefore it makes everyone look in some way lessened by the whole thing. And then you've got the obvious inconvenience for supporters who are everyone's afterthought. Yeah, I mean, Emma, bring it on to you. I mean, what you know, the potential knock-on effects of this is, and this is not being sort of melodramatic, is people stop going. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, if it was me now and you're going like, oh, was it an away trip to Arsenal? Oh, that sounds good. Arsenal's a big game. That, do you know what, it might snow? It might be a bit colder the weekend. Oh, do you know what, I won't bother. Why? It probably get cold off, and I can't be asked. I'm going to coach for five hours. Or even yeah. for a home game, I can't bother going because it might get called off. Why waste my time? Yeah, and I think that's that's one of several dangers. And then obviously the fact that it was live on TV as well. And it's as Neil said, you know, I, I would go as far as to say um, not only was it a mockery, it was an embarrassment for the women's mm. game. So for that to be live on, you know, broadcast and it's all it's dominated the news. No one's talking about the football with the football this weekend in the WCL, which is a real shame because there were some really good performances from from some teams. You know, the likes of Everton, for example, played played really well yesterday. I was at that game and they were putting a fantastic performance and yeah, nobody but... was talking about it yesterday because everyone was talking about the fact that um, this whole embarrassment happened. Um, and I think that's 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 the most frustrating thing. But, you know, sort of touching on, on a lot of what kind of Neil said is that I think there's what made it even worse is the fact that Tottenham Tottenham's game was cancelled 24 hours previously, knowing that the weather was going to be freezing for pretty much the whole day in London. Uh, they planned ahead. I think there's precautions that, that can come in. We're definitely not at a stage where every women's club in the WSL can afford under soil heating. And actually, I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and call for that because I think there's other things that need improving before we get to that stage personally. My biggest disappointment is that there's a lot of clubs out there who do have the capacity to move into men's stadiums for the odd game. Yes, it's a cost. Yes, you'll lose money. But Chelsea certainly are one of those clubs that can afford to do that. Um, They've shown that they're willing to invest in the women's team. So everyone knew it was going to be freezing conditions, move to Stamford Bridge. Um, You know, I appreciate it. It's not something you can do in 24 hours, but we knew about this weather a good week before it was coming. We knew about it at least, you know, a day or two before it was coming. So... There's just things that I think need to be dealt with. Every year in winter, there's issues with WSL clubs in the grounds. So find a backup option, find precautions, find a second ground. Look ahead to fixtures that you might think, OK, maybe we can avoid Liverpool playing Chelsea in winter where there's going to be long distances for travelling fans, etc. Why not try and get a couple of games that are a bit more local around that time of the year so that you're maybe reducing the chances of lots of groups yeah. of people being affected there's things that you can do and i think that is another frustration alongside the accountability that obviously neil said uh, but but also the contingency aspect is it's going to be cold in january i mean you know mm-hmm. I, 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 mean, d- d- I mean don't shoot, shoot the messenger the, oh, no the, the, no the, the 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 idea of but the, i think the idea that there aren't contingencies and there are there isn't the, the ability to say we're going to make certain shifts at certain times is is just a little bit ridiculous and mm. and as i say i think there's a lot of this and this is most definitely not unique to the women's game because there's a lot of things in football i mean we literally had the the madness of whatever it was that precisely went on around the time of the queen's death where the premier league was concerned and again you know without sort of being remarkably grim about this almost every organization in the country had a plan for what was going to happen when the queen passed away 
And it seems like the Premier League managed to completely get confused as to exactly what they were going to do in the immediate aftermath of theirs. And yeah. ends up making an absolute an absolute mess of the whole thing to the point that there's still ramifications for the Premier League teams. Now, in this instance, it is going to be cold in January is not is not a controversial sentence. So therefore, is there a move to be able to say, if that happens, if there's a particularly cold snap, what's our backup in terms of playing in? You know, taking the opportunity and turning and turning uh, an issue into an opportunity. You know, the idea that there could have been a moment there 24 hours ago where the, the gates of Stamford Bridge were going to be thrown open. Tickets could have been in for free. Come along, roll, roll up, roll up. You're going to see a really good game of football between Chelsea and Liverpool women. And let's be clear about this, where Chelsea would have been by some distance the favourites or be what happened in the first game of the season. It would have been a really good fun opportunity of something that would have turned a potential what we've actually ended up seeing or even just a simple postponement of a game into something that could have been a fair amount of, a fair, a fair amount of fun. And you can draw those plans up. You know, I know you can't do risk assessments at the drop of a hat and all that sort of stuff, but you could still have... 12 months in advance, this is what we do, and this is the risk assessment that goes on around it, and this is the way this will work, and this is how we'll have this looked after. And we can do that because we planned, we put plans in place, and it just feels like there was no plans in place, and then when the pressure comes on, there's the absolute panic of, it. I think effectively it's on the telly, we've got to do everything we can to ensure that it's fulfilled, because we want to ensure that we've got the, we keep the on the telly slot. It just all seems wholly unnecessary in every single way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, Philippa, I mean, bring it to you. Um, it's not, obviously it's not the first game that's been called off by bad weather, but is there also just a little bit of lack of uh, common sense? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that I really want to add to, to what's already been said. Um, one of them is um, it, it seemed absolutely obvious to me yesterday that both the managers and the teams had had a conversation about whether or not they felt it was playable. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you watch those five, six minutes that actually got played, um, you'll see that pretty much 50% of the play was down that touchline that there was clearly a massive issue with. And I think that was a deliberate ploy by both managers to say to the players, we need to highlight how bad this is. There's two choices we've got here. It's either to reduce the size of the pitch and play on a smaller size pitch and not use that part of the pitch, or we highlight it because actually this is very dangerous to the players. Um, and I think they went with the second option. And I think they were forced into that by people not making the decision that should have been made a lot sooner. I was supposed to be going yesterday. Um, I decided against it. One, um, I've got some personal things anyway, but then I, I literally had a look. The Spurs game got postponed on Saturday, which has already been mentioned. But also, if you look through the fixture list for Saturday, even throughout the whole of the men's game, throughout the pyramid, you will see that there was tens of games that was cancelled and postponed on Saturday. Now, the facilities at King's Meadow aren't going to be any better than any of the, the, the facilities at those games. So I looked at that and I just thought, for me, there is no way that I'm getting up at half past three in the morning to get a coach that's going to take six, seven hours to get there for a match that possibly isn't going to get played um, and then basically only get home nine, ten o'clock at night. So I made the decision not to go. Now, some of the people who, because, you know, I'm on the supporters club, committee I've become very friendly with there's a group of us that go on the coaches to to as many of the games as we possibly can um and to be honest the stories coming from that coach journey are quite harrowing um there was an accident on the M40 that they actually got caught up in and two people died now we can talk all we want about the safety of players and, you know, what it means for them. But just imagine that that coach was a little bit further down the road and had been involved in that accident. And there was kids on that coach. And all for what? So that the WSL can show that this game's going on, that two of the top sides that are in the Premier League have got two teams in the WSL fighting it out for three points. And for me, there isn't enough concern for people's safety, not not the players who 
let's get this right as well. They've also got to take the journey to get to that ground as well in treacherous conditions. But the fans who, you know, in freezing temperatures, you know, minus six, it was at one part of the journey. For them to have to go through all of that, they were nearly involved in several accidents themselves. They met um, at one of the service stations. Andy Kelly was actually there, who's um, the PR person for, for the club. And he'd been on to Chelsea both the evening before, so on Saturday night and on Sunday morning. And at no point did Chelsea ever say that they were concerned about this game going ahead. So those people are getting back on that coach thinking, this this game's OK. Then they were on the coach at about quarter past nine, I think it was. And they got told that there was going to be a pitch inspection at half past nine. As Emma said, it was it was about 45 minutes later when word came through that the match was going ahead to the people on that coach. So it was long after the decision had actually been made. When they actually got to the ground, um, they, they only got there about 20 minutes before kickoff and they'd set off at five o'clock in the morning, by the way. They got there 20 minutes before kickoff and none of the turnstiles were open. Now, that says to me that the people at the club did not think that that match was going to go ahead. There was a queue to get into the ground that went the full length of the stadium. Now, again, I mean, we know as Liverpool fans the kind of horrific scenes that we've seen at, at matches with people not being allowed into stadiums. Um, you know, we're probably thankful here that, that, you know, the crowds aren't massive. But we're talking four or five thousand people trying to get into that stadium. And for them not to be allowed in until 15 minutes before the kickoff of the game, um, for me, is also not acceptable. And that just says to me that they didn't expect that to, to go ahead. And they were maybe waiting until after the warm up to speak to the referee again and to try and come to the correct decision. Yeah, it seems that obviously the FA and you know, I I feel like they've put pressure onto an inexperienced referee here because whatever anybody says, when you see the, the officiating in, in the WSL or throughout the women's game, the officials to me are not as experienced and as knowledgeable as what they are in the men's game. That's my honest opinion. And I feel like they've put pressure on somebody who wouldn't feel they have the authority to turn around and say, no, this isn't the right decision. And thank God that five or six minutes into that game that he made the decision that actually it was in the player's best interest for that game to be halted and for us to play it at another date. My concern here is that when do they rearrange it and do we have a similar problem then? Because we all know when... when They've rearranged matches in the past. We've ended up with midweek games, which would mean, again, Liverpool fans, and, you know, I can only speak on, you know, what our situation is, but it would mean people taking time off work, kids coming out of school or not being able to go, and then only getting back at, what, three, four o'clock in the morning from, from London? Well, Reading was similar, wasn't it? I think Reading yeah, rearranged was like that. And when we're trying to grow the game and we're trying to encourage people to go and watch these games, all of this just isn't acceptable. And like Emma says, if if they'd have moved it to Stamford Bridge or any other stadium, Wembley, wherever you want to go, there are stadiums that would have been available to host this game. And for me, it's not too much of a stretch to say that they could have easily moved this game to that stadium to Stamford Bridge and for it to go ahead once everybody is on the road and they know that they're, they're pretty much at the game anyway. It's not too much of a stretch for me and I just find it totally unacceptable how it was all handled yesterday. The only good thing for me is that it was on BBC Two and that there's been so much noise around it because I feel like change might actually happen now. If it wasn't on the TV and if there wasn't so much noise around it, I expect that the same thing could happen again next week. Um, I don't expect that if we're in this situation again, that it, it, you know, it will happen this way. It's just, it's unacceptable. And like I say, for me, putting people's lives at risk for what, when it was pretty clear on Saturday that that match would not be able to go ahead. 
Yeah, no, you're spot on, Philippa. It's these are sort of the knock-on effects that institutions of this size should be thinking of and should be planning for. But the concern we probably will have is will they adapt? Truthfully, I don't know. Don't know. I, I highly doubt it because it's, this is not the first time we've seen bad weather and games being called off on hours notice, two hours notice. It's it, it's it's a cult. It's a, it seems to be a cultural problem with within the leading authorities in football. Is that do everything you can to get it on. If it doesn't, we'll just cancel it last minute. And I don't. I think you're right. I don't think it's acceptable for travelling fans, for local fans, and you know, I don't see. I don't see who it benefits. Uh, this sort of way of doing fixtures, but um, I suppose it's one to keep an eye on. I think, isn't it? Yeah, just just to go back to that, there's there's a thing, there's a general perception we have that basically January is colder than December, mm. quite substantially year in year out. It's as cold a month. February, I think, it might be colder than December these days. There's a bit of there's a bit of slippage around um, around the, the sort of our perceptions of the calendar versus the actual realities of the weather. In the same way that, for instance, June tends not to be the hottest month anymore. Uh, that was a couple of months that follow it are, are actually, I think, on record averaged as warmer. I think the point here is that there's there's a deliberate decision that women's football doesn't play any games from the over Christmas over the Christmas period. Um, <clears throat> That may or may not be a good thing, but there, there is a bit of an argument to say that it's quite possible that it's better to not play any games in January than to not play any ga- than to not play any games for the last three weeks of December and for the first week and a half of January. But that's something that you could again sort of think about in there as well in terms of in terms of planning and stuff like that. But on the whole, you know, it is a facilities question, but it is also just a planning question and an execution question, and that and that shouldn't be as difficult as it feels as though it is and it shouldn't be an afterthought right the way through the game it should never be an afterthought really planning and contingency and it feels as though it's sort of turned into one all the time because i think the theory is the only people that ever really inconveniences are the supporters but in this instance here that's just clearly not the case because it's massively inconvenient to the league on a reputational level and that's you know that's one of the reasons why you know philip has got a level of optimism there which is understandable um but it's why you know the the, the does just need to have been and needs to be thoughts um thoughts and then those thoughts turn into actions it's difficult you know you're of always cynical about sort of changing football because so much of it tends to sort of feel as though it'll be changed for the worst but in this instance it doesn't i don't as i say i just don't think it needs i think in general it needs to be put on the list of things in the context of women's football that needs to be looked at and addressed but that to me, it's still another conversation that starts with the word calendar. Like, literally, why, mm. you know, if we are going to have breaks in, in in quite substantial breaks in the season, there's an argument that should be made to work for the players. There's an argument that should be made to work for the fans rather than the idea that it, it just sort of feels as though it's it's for convenience's sake. There's also yeah. an argument, Neil, that, that they start the season earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because we start in, like, September normally, um, you know, long after the men's season starts, why not start it a couple of weeks earlier? Um, finish the normal time, but then don't start back up until the beginning of February or something. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons for why, you know, the the calendar notoriously starts later is because in the past, you know, WSL teams weren't playing in Europe. But now that, you know, that's changing now. And I think, you know, we mentioned the, the pressure of the game being on TV as perhaps being a a reason why the, the the game is pushed to go ahead but um you know certainly from kind of conversations that i've had it wouldn't surprise me if um you know and this is obviously just just a theory nothing like confirmed but it wouldn't surprise me if part of chelsea were kind of hoping for it to go ahead um i imagine when they saw the condition of the pitch they weren't but in their heads maybe the day before they were probably quite keen for it to go ahead because you know they're in europe and their fixture schedule is gonna going to bulk up a little bit but so I do think you know for the bigger clubs that's always a concern they don't want lots and lots of games um but unfortunately that's part and parcel of success and I think you know we're getting to a point now where women's football at the top end of it um they are having to play sort of midweek games which never really happened in women's football before and yes there is going to be a period where to begin with the football calendar for them might seem unfair compared to everyone else but Chelsea, a prime example of they're in a position now where they can they can afford bigger squads now and they have got more squad depth now and that's what they've been building. And yes, there might be two, three years where it's tough on those group of players while they adapt to a football calendar. 
But unfortunately, that's, like I say, that's part and parcel of it. And if games get postponed due to safety, which is 100% the main priority, then so be it. But I do think that, you know, as Neil and Filippo said there, there's there's ways that you can help the calendar um, for every team, not just the top teams. Um, you look at now, for example, it's Conti Cup quarterfinals and FA Cup games for the next sort of week and a half or two weeks. Move them at the start of January when it's a bit colder and their fixtures where there's less teams involved because obviously not every team has got through to certain rounds. Um and have the WSL games at the back end of January. That's one simple switch in fixtures that literally doesn't change for either team because they're playing games of football. It's just in a different competition. But the knock-on effects of WSL games getting postponed has a bigger consequence of one FA Cup game getting postponed, for example, because there is the opportunity where you can play that one-off FA Cup game at a neutral ground. In WSL games, it's obviously different because you have to have the home and away. That's part and parcel of the competition. In the FA Cup, you, you can get away without it. Same with the Conti Cup. And I think that's just a clap. Yeah, that's just one of those things. And I actually think Neil's idea of having um, sort of a winter break over January instead of December, I think, is a fantastic idea. And again, if you need to move the cup competitions earlier or later, you can either have them during that winter break where, you know, you can have the more successful teams, again, part and parcel of it, unfortunately, means they play more games. Um, you know, have the, have the teams that are still in the competition playing those games over a three-week window. Everyone else gets a break. It's just small changes, which I think can be made, you know, next year. You know, the, these things don't need five years in planning. They, they can come into place next season. I don't think it's a massive change. Very true. Very true. Uh, let's let's move back to Liverpool then, um, and we'll keep. I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking about this ongoing for the uh, for the rest of the season. Uh, before we talk about Liverpool, though, um, for those of your regular viewers of LCD Trippers, uh, we do like to get involved in charity work, and we've mentioned all the shows. Uh, so we're this year getting involved with uh, breast cancer awareness, and there are twenty fantastic women who are going to be doing the Dublin Marathon. So. What they need to do is they want to raise uh, twenty thousand pounds. So we are trying to do everything we can to help them uh, raise that money. So all the details will be in the show description. Uh, it's on our pinned tweets, um, and there's a GoFundMe page on there for you. So, like we always say, we know times are hard. If you can donate, brilliant. That's that's really it. that's great. If you can't donate, just share the link in your WhatsApp groups, your work groups. You never know who you never know who it, who it connects with, and unfortunately. Cancer is one of those things. It does touch a lot of people. So that is the charity we're doing this year. So details are in the description below. If you can help help support that, that would be brilliant. But Emma, let's talk transfers. It, it is still January. It is the thing everyone loves to talk about, transfers. And um, Liverpool women have been busy. We've had uh, two players leave, which we'll come to in a minute. We've had four players come in. Obviously, the most exciting one would be the, uh, the return of former Liverpool captain Gemma Bonner to, to the club after a... Is it a four-year hiatus since you went to City and been playing in America? Maybe yeah, it's five. Four or five years, maybe. Four or five yeah. years. So, uh, obviously, Emma, you may have known each other a long time. I obviously have a, a very excited young daughter because that is her idol. So, the fact that her idol's returned, um, she's on countdown for Wednesday for the Conti Cup because she can see Gemma again. So, a bit of a coup, though, isn't it? Getting her back. Yeah, yeah. Big big signing. Uh, Marky signing of, of January, like you say. Um, wasn't surprised in the slightest. Um, I think it was the most long overdue announcement. Um, I think everyone knew the second she said she was leaving the States and probably before that, that she was coming back. Um, yeah, she, you know, I, I've, I've spoken to Gemma um, on a lot of occasions, both professionally and, and off it. But um, yeah, while she was out in, in the US, she really enjoyed her time there. Um, Thought she learned a lot of stuff as a player. Um, even at, when she moved to Man City, she's obviously, you know, she went there and won silverware. And I actually think she should have had a, a quite a few more England appearances than, than she got under her belt. So since she last was at Liverpool, she's, you know, a completely different player in, in a good way. Um, she's obviously, you know, coming more towards the end of her career now. I still think she's got several years left in her, but, you know, it's more sort of the back end now. And I think, you know, she always... Obviously, loves Liverpool. She loves the city. Um, she's got a family, friends nearby. Um, I think she was always keen to sort of come back home, and the timing was right. Um, obviously, you know, we we weren't aware of of Jilly's retirement. We don't know when she made that decision. Um, Jilly Flaherty, obviously, um, that who also played as a centre back. Um, but I think there was an opportunity there where 
Um, Matt Beard saw that you know he might have needed to fill fill a hole um, in his back line, and and obviously Gemma was available given um, her contract ending out in America. So um, it was a perfect fit for everyone, I think, and a, a real boost to sort of kickstart the January transfer window, which I know we'll talk about more on. But um, I've been largely underwhelmed with, um, and she was probably the the, the most exciting one um, for me. And like I say, it wasn't a surprise, um, but certainly you know. A, a good addition to to the team. Yeah, Philip. I mean, uh, we'll, we will we are going to talk talk some Jilly for quite a bit uh, with her retirements. But with Jilly retiring, um, that's a it's a big it's a big character, it's a big leader leaving the club. So to bring someone of Gemma Bonner's both experience and ability, but leadership qualities, helps. You know, especially some of the younger players we've got. You know, she you know someone like a Taylor Hind. You know, and of a like that's what you need, you know, Kerry Holland having that leadership role behind them, you know, for a very experienced back line, it's probably what we've needed as well. And I, I would probably say she's probably one of the better uh, distributors as well at the back. So again, it's another string to your bow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was surprised when we actually re-signed her. Um, you know, once you know we knew she was leaving America, I thought that there might be a possibility there. Um, but it was probably the one position where I thought we probably didn't need to to do anything in January, um, and it was maybe something for the summer. Um, but then, obviously, with with Jilly later, you know, announcing her retirement, it became pretty obvious, you know, the reasoning behind getting getting Gemma back in. Um, you know, you know, I was lucky enough to watch her the first time round. Um, it was towards the back end of a, a you know, a Liverpool previous River Liverpool career. Uh, but then, you know, watched her, you know, playing for Manchester City. And, you know, I thought she was, you know, one of their better players. And, you know, she she led to quite a bit of success for Manchester City. Um, and then obviously going over to America, I think that's always a good uh, learning, you know, a place to learn your trade sort of thing over in America. You know, the standard of, of the game over there, I think, you know, is really, really high. So um, I just think it's a really good, player to have back um, and like you say to kind of replace the the experience and and leadership that we've lost with Jilly retiring we've we've pretty much covered all of that with getting Gemma back um you know she knows the club inside out um having been here for many years and been the captain of the club previously and you know I'm just excited to see her back um obviously not a great start to a to a career back at Liverpool at Manchester United last week but you know, I'm I'm hoping that uh, it's only going to go one way from there, really. Yeah, I was hoping, so. I was, I was hoping to avoid talking about the six nil. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that'll have to come up at some point. But I mean, it's, honestly, it's probably a, more of a household name that I would say uh, Liverpool have signed in German Bonner because I prefer as this one of the reasons I have Emma on as well is I know very little about the th- the three of them we we've signed, which I'm, I'm Emma's probably now going to sit in educate me which is always a good thing because quite frankly I, I like to know it helps me get to know what type of player to expect what to you know what what we should expect but at least that got it got the January window off to well Christmas Eve with a bit of a bang because it's like oh that's quite a big statement signing yeah no I think it undoubtedly is I'm, I'm intrigued by Nagano and I'm sure that Emma will know more but the very fact that mm. she's got 16 caps for Japan is the sort of thing that makes you think that you know there could be there could well be a player there. She's still relatively young simultaneously, which means that she's obviously been very exciting uh, in her younger years uh, to sort of grab attention. And uh, part of what I was actually tuning in for yesterday to watch uh, mm. Liverpool versus Chelsea was when she was in the starting lineup. I was like, oh, all right, uh, let's uh, let's see what she's about then. Uh, let's get a little look at that. I think she looks as though she's one. Um, She's one where Liverpool of of you know the very fact that she got picked as well suggests that 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 you know she's she's gone straight into the 11 there which which again sort of grabbed my attention i think it's been increasingly uh tough around the, the sort of the kerry holland question because she's so important and you know her fitness mm. is, is so important to liverpool so another pair of hands in there might be no bad thing i don't know much at all about you know even even just sort of looking at the backgrounds of mary taylor uh and and, so, and sophie lundergaard you know precisely what to expect but i think on both of them a thing i would point out is that both of them are, are still relatively young and Liverpool may well be sort of building, you know, there's there's the thing to sort of say is that if Liverpool do what we hope they do this season and, and the the morale blow, that is the 6-0 against Manchester United put to one side, if Liverpool manage to sustain the WSL status, 
the job for the the club as a whole is to is to effectively be be on the march towards building the next team um now and it may well be that a couple of these signings are with that in mind uh with the idea of a couple moving on uh, and a few more being added and that this is the sort of first sort of phase of these so no i think i'm obviously like everyone else you know Gemma Bonner's of you know cv speaks for itself and i say you know emma may well know more but you know fukunagano there is it's a really sort of striking sign and given given a background uh hopefully obviously from a liverpool point of view it works but the other two i don't know very much about at all but it does suggest to me that liverpool are very much having one eye on the future uh in these dealings as much as anything else it's cool then that you you educate us then on on our, on our other three signings yeah, well, as Neil says, I'm actually, um, you know, while I think Gemma Bonner is the statement signing, I, I think I think Fika Nagamo is the best signing of of the lot. Um, yeah, the Japanese, um, you know, league is sort of really, really shooting up at the moment um, in women's football. Obviously, their national team has had previous success, winning the World Cup in 20, 2011 and then obviously being, in, uh, you know, runners up in twenty fifteen. So on a national level, they've had success, but the domestic league hasn't really taken off um, to the same level. But over the last um, sort of two, three years, we've seen um, Asian players coming into the, the WSL. And, you know, we've seen the likes of, you know, Mane Iwabuchi really, really thriving, um, who obviously Tottenham have just taken on loan from Arsenal. Um, fantastic signing for them. Um, so I, I think, you know, getting players over in, from Japan is, is, is an interesting one, certainly. She's a creative player. She's very technical, very good on the ball, very gifted. Um, and that's why obviously Matt Biz brought her in um, to add a, a little bit of creativity. I think she can play in a, numerous roles across midfield. Um, I think she's probably got the ability to play as a, as a little number 10 as well. Um, so I am quite excited to see what she can do and what she can change. Um, as Neil says, um, Miri and Sophie are both very young. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about Miri Taylor. She's one that um, has sort of been on the radar for a few years now, Liverpool have been, you know, ever since Matt Beard came in to Liverpool, really, they've been monitoring her situation. So she was another one that's been linked with Liverpool for a long, long time now. Leicester were very interested in her as well. Very close to signing her before Liverpool got her over the line this January. So um, she's actually um, been playing out in the States, but she's she's been playing as a forward. Um, okay. So I, what I think is interesting is actually that she has come in well, from my understanding and from what Matt Beard has said, that she has come in as a midfielder for Liverpool. Um, from conversations with people around women's football, um, they, they think she's got the attributes to play in that centre mid role. Um, like a sort of a Kerry Holland, she breaks up play. Um, she can be a bit of a box to box, but she's also got that obviously ability to play as a, as, as a centre forward. So hopefully she's got a few goals in her, which I think Liverpool need. You know, there's absolutely no goals from anywhere else on the pitch other than Katie Stengel. So um, I, th I think that's which, really important. Yeah, which brings the point which I've, look, we've seen a few conversations on social media and I think some of these are valid concerns is are Liverpool playing a little bit of a risk game with a, the lack of a, of a Stengel backup? Because it looks mm -hmm. like Leanne Keenan's probably going to be at least, what, end of Feb before she's back? So got a little while. And that's, and that's assuming she comes back and, and is firing straight away, which has such a lengthy injury. Yeah. And we saw with Ste we saw with Stengel one hip one hip knock she missed one game and you're sort of going it's a lot of square pegs in round holes it's not to disparage Yana Daniels or Ginny van der Sanden they're all very good players but their natural position is wide they don't play mm -hmm. they're, they're not really designed to play through the middle because that's just not their game you know it's it is what it, it is what it is you know you have your strengths but are yeah. they both playing a little bit of a risk game there. Oh, 100% in my opinion. That's why I'm massively underwhelmed with the January transfer window. It was clear that Liverpool needed midfielders. Um, that's been clear for a very long time. They needed them in the summer. Um, Liverpool wanted them. They didn't get them. Um, I don't think that's a good enough excuse. Um, I think a club of Liverpool, and if the recruitment's right and it's done well enough, then, um, you know, if, if if you're spending your entire transfer window chasing a midfielder, I still don't understand why we didn't, we didn't really sign one of the quality that was needed. Um, that was a mistake. And then it meant that they've had to go out in January and get three of them in. Um, and again, I think two of them are p potentially ones for the future. One is an in-between of a forward and, and a midfielder. So I'm not fully convinced, apart from maybe, you know, Nagamo. And again, you don't know. It's such a different league, um, how quickly she's yeah. going to settle. So I'm not even convinced that we've sort of, you know, filled that void. And then from a forward's point of view, yeah, I'm really, really concerned. Um, I the, think the, 
Yana Daniels has, has, has done well, but obviously, you know, she is meant to be a sort of third, fourth choice striker. And it's like, well, there's there's just, there's no goals. And um, yeah, no, I, I think we needed a forward, absolutely. The 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 conversation around end of February uh, for Leanne, depending on what Nick, she comes back in anyway, full stop. It removes the idea that the, the fixtures that are most important for Liverpool in arguably, arguably happen back to back in the first week of mm-hmm. February. Yeah. Uh, Reading at home and, and Leicester at home are season defining fixtures yeah. you know the day liverpool or the weekend liverpool get 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 battered 6-0 by manchester united actually in a really weird way the worst result for liverpool is that leicester beat brighton and hove albion that mm-hmm. liverpool lose to manchester united take the score line out of it for a minute that liverpool lose to manchester united away is not a surprise to anybody but that leicester don't just pick themselves up and, and nick one but that they get find a way to a 3-0 against brighton suggests that they may well have wintered in a way that means that they could look to get a bit of a surge up the table our match against the was postponed uh, just before the the break, and we could have done a play in that. Then, to be honest with you, when mm. they they looked they looked really rather broken. Because and they were under been... different management as well. And Willie Kurtz yeah. come in and a very very experienced manager who proved how good he was at Bristol City and Everton. And Everton, I think, up until you know very recently under Brian Sorensen, were probably having massive regrets at letting him go so early. So. Yeah, I am very concerned about Leicester now under Willie Kirk, I think, and their transfer business. Um, and I think there's there'll be still a few more names to be announced over the next week, but it's been very impressive from them in January. So they pulled that together. Liverpool still are in a position where they have. And those two games are just, just so significant. You know, they really are so significant. There's not, you know, you look at the three fixtures that follow that. Um, Arsenal, you know, from, from Liverpool's point of view, there's another long break, although hopefully it'll, there'll be a cup game or two in there, but Arsenal, Tottenham and, and Everton, uh, two of them away, um, and then that's backed up even by by West Ham away. Now, I wasn't that impressed with West Ham when they when they turned up to, to Prenton Park, and the, the, the numbers sort of, when you look at West Ham, the, the, the numbers sort of belie the league position to an extent, but they've been managing to get the odd result here and there. You know, Liverpool don't want to go into those four games feeling pressure from behind they really don't want to do that and so you know i think i think it is a little bit of a risk and i think that there is the the best way to be able to plan for next season from a liverpool point of view is to have genuine security in this one and last time we were all having this conversation the four of us that's what we were talking about the fact that it did feel as though it was it, it, it liverpool had positioned themselves to have that security the idea of a resurgent leicester I think throws not just question marks in for Liverpool, I hasten to add, throws question marks in for Reading, question marks in for Brighton as well. You know, no one needs that to become a dogfight down there, but most of all Liverpool really, because if it looks as though Liverpool have failed to to make the sort of investments into the first team squad that the first team squad requires, and then they end up going down, you know, for that to happen once, I think everyone can can you know in every single level right the way across the club with the club's corporate partners as well i hasten to add everyone can allow once to be an accident and say well they turned it around relatively quickly twice will look will look slipshod to be honest with you twice will Mm. look like you know people need to have done a little bit better and that's the pressure that's on them uh, at this point and if there isn't another attacking sign and then that pressure is massively heaped on 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 katie stengel um Shanice van der Sanden and, and Mel Lawley to a degree. And, and you know, Yara Daniels, I think, has played pretty close to the best of her ability uh, over the course of the season. None of this is about the best of people's ability. None of this is about people not trying. None of this is even necessarily about the manager and how he's setting them up. It's literally, at times, part of what can do for you is, is just simply quality of player and depth of squad. And if Liverpool are lacking in functioning attackers, the thing to point out is that Leanne's injury did not happen end of mid-December. <laughs> it happened some time yeah. ago. And there's been loads of time to plan around this, mm-hmm. which is why it's quite hard. And I think I think the manager highlighted it's quite it's quite expensive to get a strike, and and it's quite difficult. But it's a bit like I think everyone knows that though. You know, there any, are strikers in, available. There are strikers any, available. Other clubs have got them. Yeah, but also in any form of football, goal scorers are always the most expensive. Everyone, it's it's kind of a it's just a part of parcel of football, unfortunately. So, but obviously we don't know who they targeted or who they're looking for. Well, Emma might, but she's not going to tell me. Uh, so. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're not really looking anymore. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. We had two outgoers, didn't we, Philip? We had Charlotte Wardlaw's recalled from her loan at Chelsea, which is frustrating, but at the same time, she wasn't playing a lot. I suppose from if, you're, if you've got your Chelsea head on, you're going, we'll take you there to get games at centre mid. You are getting games. So... We may as well bring you back and send you somewhere else. I mean, she's got she's got off to Lewis now, hasn't she, for six months? 
So it's a shame because she was brilliant last year for us, more as a wing back, but we didn't really get to use her much in centre mid. I don't know if that's the, the tactics, I don't know if it's fitness or it just sometimes it just doesn't it doesn't fall for you. You know, sometimes it doesn't work out for you. Yeah, I mean I was really impressed with her, even in central midfield when she played. Mm. I thought I thought she looked like the most um the play with the most ability, I would say, um, along with Carrie Holland. And I would have liked to have seen more of those two playing together. Um, I think what's become clear at the start, well, the first half of the season, should we call it, is that playing two in the midfield has left us exposed quite a lot, I would say. Um, so I think it, it was a case of maybe Matt saying, I don't feel like I've got the right blend of players to be able to play three in there together. Um, and maybe that's something that he's tried to address with the signings that he's made. Um, and maybe that's that's another reason why they're not looking at another forward because he's only planning maybe to use two going forward, um, you know, in the future. But then you look at the side that he picked yesterday and he still had Lawley. Uh, Van der Sanden and Stengel in there, even though he mm. did pick the three in the midfield because Matthews played in midfield again yesterday. So it's going to be an interesting one for me, um, you know, getting that balance right of having enough threat on the break, but also, you know, not leaving yourself open to to having problems like we have done um, in the first half of the season, I would say. Um I'm disappointed, to be quite honest, because I think that she showed enough to to warrant more game time. Mm. Um, I think it's possibly understandable from Chelsea's side to to want to send her somewhere where she's going to get more game time. And she's definitely, for me, going to be starting for Lewis, uh, where she's ended up. Um, and I think that's fair for her as well, for her development. Um, but I don't think... I don't think I agree with how um, Chelsea do the business, if I'm quite quite honest, because I feel like they monopolise the the transfer market in a lot of ways. Um, so they, they've they got these players and they, they sign them up on three-year contracts, which is what they did with Charlotte Wardlaw before sending her back out on loan to us. And they've basically said to us, you need to play her X amount of time, otherwise we're going to recall her. And I don't think it's right that they use other clubs in order for their players um, to get the experience. Um, that's just my personal thing, and I know it's something that happens all throughout football, but it's not a part of the game that I particularly like. I think that, that clubs should only really have players that they intend to play themselves. Um and if they're not intending to play them, then they shouldn't have them and they should either let them have permanent moves to other clubs or they should invest in them themselves and develop them themselves. Um, mm. Just my personal opinion. But, yeah, I, I'm a bit gutted, really, that, that one, we weren't able to sign her permanently and, two, that, you know, she didn't get the, the game time that meant that she was able to stay with us for the full season because yeah. I think she's a real talent. Yeah, I, I, I do see the point you make, Philip. I mean, the, you must play in so many games. I do get it from Chess point of view because that's the reason they've loaned her. But then there's also part of me going, playing professional football, part of it is earning your spot. And it is your, why you start. And you're starting on merit. You're not starting because the club who you're on loan from said, you have to play. It's, and you know, sometimes for some players, and men's game, women's game, some players have a loan for a year and it doesn't work out and it's not, right from football-wise, but personal development-wise, you learn a lot from it not working out the odd time because then you go like, you kind of know where you went wrong. You kind of know why it didn't fit and you can use that to develop. Um, so they're trying to get that fine balance between giving players experience but, again, not dictating to a club. And I don't I don't actually know what the answer is to how you get the balance right, to be honest. I don't know if Emma or Neil, you've got sort of a, a view on that. I think certainly on like as Wardlaw as an, as an example, um, yeah, I, I personally wasn't surprised, and um, I thought it was fine really for her to leave. It, it, mainly because you know, as far as my understanding was in the summer, um, obviously Charlotte Wardlaw did very good for Liverpool in a full-back position in the Championship season. Um, Liverpool wanted to sign her on a permanent deal. She chose to sign on a permanent deal with Chelsea. Um, that's out of Liverpool's hands. But then when they went back and had a conversation, it was actually, you know, 
Liverpool really like they didn't really want full backs then in the summer. They wanted a midfielder, and I don't think um, you know she, she certainly wasn't an option. And as I've mentioned previously, you know they they failed to, to get their midfield targets in the summer, and it got to sort of the last couple of days of the transfer window, and he just wanted a few more bodies in. So um, you know Liverpool went back to Chelsea and and sort of said, you know, can we take Wardle in as a midfielder? Um, and realistically, she was never really going to fit the the number of games cap. And Chelsea sort of gave it gave it a few months and then was like, nah, she's not getting the game time. We'll call her back and send her out on loan. So I do think as that example, I wasn't surprised because, yeah, as I say, um, certainly from as far as my understanding as, as, as how the, the sort of the loan transfer went about, I don't think Matt was ever really realistically going, going to use her too much. Um, he probably just wanted her there really more more to have the, the squad option. Um, and obviously it ended up not really needing to be transpired. So, yeah, um, well, I, I personally wasn't surprised and I think it's a good move for Charlotte. And I think I think championship football is probably where where she she probably should be playing at the moment. I think, you know, she is good enough to to get into, you know, WSL sides, but not consistently. So I, I actually think it's it's a really good move for her. Cool. So the other person who sadly left us was a. Uh... Julie Flaxy, who decided ever to um, uh, retire, um, which is, you know, this is going to be, a, you know, this is a lady who's going to be one of the legends of women's football, you know, everything she won with Arsenal, Chelsea, she was brilliant for West Ham, and look, really looking forward to a play for Liverpool, you know, she, she did well, she did well for Liverpool, you know, in your back three, you know, um, wasn't always easy for her, the transition to Liverpool, uh, with some of the social media nonsense that we saw, uh, but it's a big blow um, to lose someone of that quality. Yeah, I think when when she signed in the summer, I was probably one of those that thought, wasn't sure we needed another experienced sort of centre-back. I, I'd quite wanted someone who perhaps had a, had a little bit more legs, a bit more pace, um, just to sort of counteract the the Neef Fahis and the, and the Meg Campbells that, that we kind of already had in there. Um, but yeah, I thought she stepped up and she was one of the better defenders, actually. Um, in the first half of the season. So it, it's definitely a blow for her to go. Um, and that's obviously just on her six months at Liverpool. Her career is absolutely astonishing and she deserves um, a lot of accolades. A very, very impressive career. Um, she will obviously go down in the history books, um, you know, for for her appearances in the WSL. Um, I think she scored the first goal in the, in, in the WSL. So, um, yeah, a, a legend of the competition. I think it's fair to say that word is used too much, but Jilly Flaherty is one. Um, phenomenal career. She should be unbelievably proud. And I think Liverpool are very lucky to have had her as part of the club for, for, for a few months. And yeah, I would have loved to to have had her for the, for the whole of the season. And, and it is a loss for the second half of the season because, as I said, I think she actually really stepped up and, and, and she showed um, sort of the way that she was able to read the game and just her general game management. Um, in the first half of, of, of this season. So, yeah, a, a real blow and I wish her all the best. Mm. Neil, yeah, um, sadly, she will be sadly missed, won't she? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a couple of games towards the the end of the, the, the run moving into the winter where you could see all the qualities that she had. Uh, I think that it was, you know, she was excellent in that game against West Ham United that I mentioned before where West Ham didn't impress. Mm. She was, you know, absolutely genuinely tremendous. thought she was good against Arsenal uh, all the time at uh, home. I remember seeing her and, and thinking that the reading of the game, the anticipation, the issue was just obviously the, the, the sort of raw pace of some of those Arsenal women. But then they're, they're catching a lot of people out uh, with that. And the whole circumstance around it as well sort of seems just deeply sad um, mm. in a slightly odd sideline i actually had jilly uh in our studio uh, uh the week before um she was uh the, the week before and and uh, our, our game was then called off and then and then the the, the events that precipitated her retirement occurred and you know she was great <laughs> to be honest i had a really nice time yeah. uh and you know we were talking a lot about the game and she was doing another podcast with a with 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 a, with a, uh, a podcast that's out of london but we were patching her in remotely and she was she was great on that as well and she was great talking about the game really good as an ambassador for the game but genuinely just a nice person to spend some time with um which mm. you're always a bit nervous about with any footballer and i don't mean that to be sort of disparaging it's just suddenly there's someone knocking around uh for an hour or so and yeah uh watching her uh, make notes on the back of the the, the 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 bag with which in which i brought her toast uh, rather than actually just get a piece of paper. She was like, no, I just, I'll be fine with this. Don't worry at all. I was thinking, well, okay, absolutely. You crack on. She was great. And and, and she was, as I say, she was excellent in that 2-0 win against West Ham. 
it's good in a sense that that's our last game playing for Liverpool because it's nice to bow out on a victory in a clean sheet, especially if you're a defender. Mm-hmm. But it's obviously mm-hmm. a, you know, a hugely significant and, and personal shame. And the, the thing I would sort of point out with it is, you know, what this is to an extent is this is, it's a very human moment, this. And it's one of those times where I think we actually get to realise, I suspect um, there are players who play, who play who play football at a number of levels where if they could do this, or more accurately, if the financial reward wasn't so great, because this is part of the thing of the fact that ultimately, you know, we know women's players are nowhere near as well remunerated as, as men's players, at, least, at the very least until you get down to League One, arguably. The idea that there's been this sort of personal thing and this this, 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 this guiding figure in the way in which she viewed football is lost to her, and she just doesn't want to play football now. I think is perfectly reasonable. And I suspect there's a lot of men's mm-hmm. players for whom a similar sort of tragic event it cares, uh, that comes as a real shock, who'd love, I suspect, to be able to say, you know what, I don't need to play this game anymore. But the truth of the matter is, if you're on unbelievably, you know, enriching life, enriching life changing contracts, there's pressure on you to eke out every last penny. The very fact that Jilly's made a really human decision to say that, you know, she doesn't want to eke out every last penny, that it's not it's not worth it at this time, that she's in a position to do that. I think it speaks volumes, speaks volumes for her, but I think it also speaks volumes for the times the pressure we put all footballers on. Um, and that if there was this figure who was a guiding light as to why she loved the game and the idea of going to work feels just too hard. The extent to which I can't like I can't put into words how much I respect that decision yeah. and respect the, the frankness with which it's been made and respect it. It helps me ever obviously ever slightly having having a brief sort of hour or so to get to know the person who's making it, but to understand all the things that filter into that because ultimately this is her life and she's made this decision in the context of what's going to make her life happy. And as I say, if she was in a world, and we all wish women's players were, play, were paid more, to be really clear, but if she was in a world where she was walking away from £150,000 a week, it might feel really rather distant, different to the world where she is, that, that, that she operates in. But the decision that she's made is a human one. I think it should be hugely respected. I think it should remind us something about footballers, that the people, all footballers, that the people first and foremost. And, you know, it is, from a Liverpool point of view, it is it is a real blow because there was a footballer there who obviously had a lot to contribute to Liverpool between now and the end of this campaign and possibly into next as well because there's a couple of other defenders who are of a certain age who Liverpool have got um, where there might have had to be a bit of a hard decision to make if the club was going to kick on. Now, that's less likely to be there now given the fact that Jilly's, you know, that Jilly's taking the choice to retire but you know that that that's probably a decision that Matt Beard would have wanted to have that's now gone but there's loads and loads of good reason why and as I say again really human reason why very very well said Neil uh so before we go then let, let we've already sort of touched on it. let's a little bit of the lay of the land so sort of coming up for Liverpool now is uh we're in the Conti Cup quarterfinal home to West Ham weather, weather permitted uh and and then we've got uh Chelsea Chelsea away in the in the FA Cup and then we've got let's be honest the big games, which is the two two games of February, which is Les, uh, Leicester and Brighton at, at home. That is, the, I'll be honest, those two games to me, you win those two games to me, season's, for me, season's boxed. It's now planned for next season. We don't win those two games. That's a, a nervy end of the season. Philip's already seen how crap my nerves are when things are going well as she had to con- as she had to cancel me through the Bristol win which she still reminds me of which is <laughs> always good fun uh so Philippa how are you sort of feeling nerves kicking in yet don't do need to start you know lying uh, down in the darkened room no I, I I'll be honest I'm I'm not particularly nervous I think I will be if we go to that Leicester game and you know we struggle in it I think mm. I think that's the main thing for me I think um Neil uh, mentioned the West Ham game for me that showed that you know we're more than capable of holding our own in this league. You know, we for me we were far the better side in that game. Um and I think it in a strange way, um the match getting um abandoned yesterday kind of then takes us into another game against West Ham where we can potentially get our confidence up in the Conti Cup um before we you know go into those that run of like league games where I feel we really need to get the results out of those games. Um, you know, I was I was only talking to Neil about it yesterday, but when you actually look at the fixtures that we've had so far against the teams in the bottom half of the of the table, we've played Spurs, Brighton, and Reading all the way from home. So that to me is a positive that we've got those teams to come 
uh, sorry, I was going to say sorry, to Anfield it's, then. It's, it's red in Leicester, sorry, not Brighton. I'm getting me mixed. Yeah, well. yeah. So, you know, we've still got those teams to play at home um, at Prenton Park. And, you know, they're the big games for me. If, if we, you know, get get wins out of those games, the season's, you know, more than, more than safe in my eyes. So, um, I think we've got I think we've got Leicester quite close together. I think both home and away now um, because of the rearranged game, um, which is going to be really interesting um, because you would think that that Leicester in their eyes would would feel that they need to to at least win one of those and fail to get beaten the other. Um, that's the way I would have to look at it if it was you know the boot was on the other foot so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other the other factor in this as well is the fact that that Reading have actually played two more games than us at this point, yeah. um, and I think that's a really important thing to point out. Um, mm-hmm. I've not quite looked at what fixtures they have remaining, but you know to have played two games more and be a point behind us, I think is is a really positive thing for us. Um, and then, you know, yesterday that six minutes that we did see, I felt I felt we started that game really well, and I think had shown that we'd learned a lot from the Man United game, uh, where I thought we were very passive and basically allowed Manchester United to to impose their game on us. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think I think United this season are you know one of the top three uh, in this league. They've they've shown that they're, they're really up there with Arsenal and and um, Chelsea now. Um, I think that you know there's a real chance that they could actually spring a surprise and win the league this year. Um, but I felt we we allowed them far too much to play the game, and I'm sure that they've they've sat down after that game and looked at that and said, you know, we're not going to allow that to happen again. So in a strange way, um, I think it might actually be a positive for us that that we got that six nil defeat as soon as we came back. Um, I take on board the point that Neil raised earlier about you know Leicester kind of um, seemed to have picked up a little bit of momentum. Um, as they come back after the winter break, you know, with the new manager, etc. Um, but you know, we've got a real opportunity there to to kind of like knock the stuffing out of them a little bit. Um, and I feel like we really need to. We, you know, we need to get that three points against Leicester and and kind of knock that confidence from them again. Um, so I want as many people there as possible, please, getting behind the side. It's- um, it's massive, absolutely yeah. massive. Just you know, to contextualise it in a really direct way, ultimately the um, last season, uh, in the end, the case is that Birmingham go down with eleven points. Uh, the season before that, uh, Bristol go down with twelve. Uh, the season before that's the COVID interrupted season where Liverpool were on course for nine, um, now allowing for a little bit of a a surge somewhere, an unlikely result. You still get to about 12, maybe 13, maybe 14, and even going to seasons before when it was the league had fewer teams and there was Yeovil who were really struggling, they find themselves, uh, the, the side that came above Yeovil in both seasons was Everton and they got 12 and 14 points. Liverpool sit right now uh, in, the, in the circumstance they find themselves with eight. So if they were to win the, the two games that I was talking about before, the two home games that I was talking about before, that's 14 points. Now, it's not 14 points and feet up, but it will be a situation where it's 14 points with 10 games to go. So you'd feel as though you could have a level of security that Liverpool would be would be able to feel relatively safe, given historical precedence and so on, from that position. But you still need to go and win the games. Mm-hmm. And that's the... that You know, I can say this, but that that's why... This is the picture. And also, I'll say again, if they don't win those games, certainly if they didn't win both of them, it's very, you know, the four that then follow are would feel like the tide is rising because elsewhere, all the games are going on and people are just picking up points. But the Reading point that Philippa makes is really, really sound as well. If you have a look at Reading so far this season, they've only, they've only got points in home games and the only team around us and them they've got left to play at home is Brighton. So they've got to find a way there to, to improve what they're doing on the road. You know, I, so none of this is me saying Liverpool, you know, are by no means favourites to put themselves in a position where they're favourites to go down. The point is more that they just can't allow um, for any complacency. In it. And the two home games early February are not quite season defining, but they're possibly defining how the season will feel. And then if they get six points, there's every every chance that ends up being a path to a universe where they end up with 20 points at the end of the campaign and it really feels like something to build on but if they don't there's every chance that we're talking about a relegation dogfight as we get into May and it'll make the whole season feel differently it'll make the summer feel differently and it'll make next year feel differently It's, it's worth pointing out as well that the Reading home game is before Leicester 
And I think if you if if Liverpool win that game, um, it makes the Leicester one um, far more comfortable in the sense of mm. a point is okay. Um, just just don't lose it because you know that would mean obviously Leicester gaining grounds. But I do think Reading, as 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 we've said with the fixtures and the fact that they've had games in hand, um, they've got absolutely no budget whatsoever. So while Leicester have improved both, I think, managerially, also in the transfer window, and they probably will more, I can see them, you know, picking up more points. Um, Reading haven't got that capacity to improve. Like, they've got the squad they've got. They are where they are. Um, they can't really do much to change it, <laughs> really, mm. um, apart from obviously on the pitch. So, but obviously Leicester have got those outside factors where they can actually change it. Um, so I do think Reading are probably the ones who are probably going to be shaking in their boots a little bit now. So if, if Liverpool beat Reading um, and then travel to Leicester, uh, sorry, host Leicester seven days later and, and get a point, I think that's fine. Um, and then obviously there's Brighton again later on in the season. And as we've said, Reading have got some really tough fixtures um, in the second half of the season. So um, I, I agree. I don't think it's season defining, but I would argue maybe the Reading game is. Um, the Leicester one, I would say, pro- probably less so, but it's certainly a big, a big month. Yeah. Well, you just teased me up for my question, which Neil was nearly destroyed with all his facts there, which was if I offered <laughs> you four, po- if I offered you four points from those two games, do you take it? Before, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the way Neil was explaining, I was thinking that this question's not gonna work now, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I take it but, I agree, but I agree with Emma on the order yeah. as well because just keeping keeping Leicester at arm's length, but putting Reading right back down in there would be no yeah. bad thing. I think at this point, especially if you know if 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 a sort of prognosis of Leicester's future is accurate, you know Liverpool just need to get into a situation where those two are duking it out at the bottom, and by duking it out, hopefully what the, one of them has no dukes, but, you know, uh, and Liverpool are able then just to sort of to make relatively serene progress. I think it's important, and I think it's important for how the club sort of views itself and its standing, and I'd actually venture it's important for the idea of recruitment as well in the summer. I think being able to point at the Manchester United thing, as has been said on this. You know, that's the journey that Liverpool have got to look to go on over a period of time. And it's now tougher because there is actually also Manchester United and there's actually Tottenham Hotspur and there's actually, you know, there's there's, there's other stuff that's happening. And I think Philip has point around the idea that Chelsea are able to to end up farming out a lot of good young talent and holding a really big squad is valid and it makes it difficult. But Liverpool have got to be able to offer a convincing we're in this to genuinely compete plan. And I think if you end up limping to 10th, it's not quite the same as cruising yeah. to a comfortable ninth. And that might seem like the smallest possible difference, but I don't think it, it may not necessarily be here. I think the idea it's, of being able to say we're upwardly mobile really, really matters. Yeah. It's the percep- it's the perception of it was always comfortable. Whereas oh, it's a bit of a oh, we stayed up, but God, that was hard work. That I hope next season's better. I know what you mean. So before we go then, um, uh, Emma, any anything exciting coming up from yourself in terms of women's football, in terms of all your articles because they're, they're always a good they're always a good read oh god um yeah i'm, I'm, I'm no actually pressure. Been working no pressure. On, um yeah no i have actually been working on um a piece for several months now i don't want to say too much of it because i don't want another journal to nick it but um <laughs> put it this way philippa's uh gripes with chelsea and the charlotte ward law and loanings um it's not too dissimilar to that but it's more on sort of academy players and uh perhaps uh, a lack of incentive to uh, invest in uh, WSL academies because of big clubs monopoly on on them um so that's a big a big investigative piece i've been working on for several months now so looking to maybe get that out sort of next week but cool we'll see that sounds, um, that's good well yeah. be, where can people find you on twitter then because they, sh- they should follow you anyway because um, your articles are really really good on, on well, thank you i appreciate that's that what, it's, it's what I, what, to be fair it's what i used to be research to be fair so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie you know i'm not gonna lie i'm mostly shite Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> my, my yeah, mum says that. Neil, Neil from the outfield rap. Anything exciting coming up from the women's side of things? Um, normally, there normally is. There will be something, but I'm behind on events today. You've got me on a bad day on a Monday, Chris. I just basically get through Mondays, limp through. Uh, and I know, then, that, uh, I know that feeling. Yeah, and then and then sort of and then look at the broader scheme of plans another time so i'll have to pass for now but there will obviously be i mean what, what i will say is that i did speak to harriet Pryor from the anfield rap last week um on on the uh on the the, the this is uh, the anfield rap um podcast so you can listen to that free podcast there we are. So there 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 it's all on liverpool fc women so, uh, there you go so, uh, philip uh, anything anything that could from the liverpool women supporters club as you are the fans of all knowledge for this 
I don't know what I can say or what I can't say. Keep on catching up there. Yeah, just uh, keep your eyes open for something at the end of the season. That's all I'll say then. Uh, oh. But yeah, interesting. Oh, well, basically, okay. basically, join, join. Oh, okay, I thought it was getting exclusive then. I thought, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But listen, once again, thank you all for joining me. It's been really, really good. And listen, we'll see you guys all very, very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.